Hi, welcome to another episode of Tech Explained. Today I want to talk to you guys about something that everybody has an opinion about, everybody's heard of, and it's very popular in drifting and racing applications, and that is the use of a turbocharger. Basically, it's a thing like this. Everybody knows what they look like. This one looks a little bit out of the ordinary, and that immediately reaches one of the points of the story that I'd like to tell you because I want to differentiate between two types of turbos and that's an OEM or original equipment manufacturer turbo such as this Mitsubishi turbo that I'm holding right now which is made for a road car so a production car that has a turbo from the factory um, that's what we call an OEM original equipment manufacturer turbo and that's this turbo it has a kind of a strange shape the flange is a bit strange, you would expect a rectangular flange like a T3 or a T4 as it's called and the downpipe flange is a bit strange and that's also because in a road car production vehicle there could be a catalyzer on there or some other type of downpipe so this is a bit of an old ball shape of a turbo uh, the other type of turbo I'd like to talk about is what we would call an aftermarket turbo and that's a turbo that looks basically kind of straightforward. It has a round intake, round outlet. It has a normal snail house without this section on it. And it has um, just a, the regular look like everybody, like a kid would draw a turbo. Um, the big thing with OEM turbos is their quality. This is made with hundreds of millions of research because they're made for a huge amount of cars. You could find this type of turbo could go into a Mitsubishi uh, Lancer Evo, in this case it's an Evo 10 turbo, or uh, a different version of this turbo could go into a BMW or a Volvo or something like that. So there is a lot of budget with the manufacturer to make a turbo like this and that makes them very high quality. Uh, the cartridge is the center section of the turbo, so that's this piece and you connect the oil line over there, the, the intake of the oil line, the pressure side and the side where the oil gets dumped back into the sump of the engine and that's a very important part of the turbo because that basically is the quality that you're talking about and the cartridge of an OEM turbo will last 100 or 200 thousand kilometers simply because it has a very high quality of parts, the bearings are very high quality it's basically two types of bearings, the bearing that uh, controls the motion of the turbo in this way and there's the bearing that controls or stabilizes the turbo in this position and these are both of very high quality in this turbo. Um, when we talk a bit more about the cartridge that's one of the first things I'd like to talk about. Um, you could basically put turbos in two categories and that's a ball bearing turbo and a journal turbo. Ball bearing turbo that's a turbo which has a uh, as the name suggests a ball bearing in the center section in the cartridge and a journal turbo is a turbo that has the turbo shaft floating on oil just like your crankshaft or the camshaft of your engine that's uh, basically the, a normal type of turbo and what you would see is that on a small turbo like this one um, you would regularly see the journal turbo so the oil floating uh, type and on a bit of a bigger, more expensive turbo you would see ball bearing. And the reason for that is that um, these small turbos they make a lot more revs, so they go 150, 200,000 RPM. And a bigger turbo with a bigger wheel that will just make a lot less RPM because it has more mass, because it has a bigger diameter. So the ball bearing technology for that is already there and there's no ball bearing technology yet for this turbo it's coming it's some manufacturers like Ferrari are working with it it's not there yet um, so basically what what you would see is that the smaller turbos are the journal type and the bigger turbos uh, like the tuner turbos or, or some massive applications for trucks or whatever they would be ball bearing simply because they make less uh, RPM um, the ball bearing also has a, a disadvantage and that's the thing that uh, it's almost impossible to rebuild them. So the rebuild cost of a ball bearing is so high that you're just better off buying a brand new turbo where on this OEM turbo, this Mitsubishi turbo, um, you can just rebuild the center, the cartridge as it's called, for maybe 200 euros and then the turbo, the, the center section of it is basically brand new. So that's a big disadvantage of a ball bearing turbo. They're more expensive to buy 
they're too expensive to rebuild and the journal turbo is just a standard type of turbo it will do a lot more rpm than a ball bearing turbo and it's cheaper to overhaul um, if you would stick to the normal wheel so on one side of the turbo you would have the compressor wheel and on the other side you'll have the turbine wheel so the exhaust gas comes in right over here and it exits right over there the shaft goes through the cartridge goes into the compressor wheel right over here and then um, it builds up the pressure which goes into the engine via by means of the intercooler of course just over there so that's the thing between a ball bearing and a journal turbo um, a lot of people also seem to have some misunderstanding about how a turbo works. When I talk to people it sometimes seems that they believe that a turbo works like a windmill. So the exhaust gas comes out of the engine and it just turns the wheel around like it's a windmill getting uh, energy from the wind. That's actually not completely true. The actual energy a turbo works on is thermal energy. So what happens is that the combustion chamber of the engine becomes hot with the exhaust gases and the exhaust gases expand out of the combustion chamber into the turbo through the manifold and that's the actual energy that you're using so the expansion uh, uh, of the gas that's where the energy is at that therefore it's also very important to conserve that energy and you have to conserve that energy both in the manifold and in the turbo itself so it's very important that you get the right size and you get the right type of manifold that's why I'd like to talk now about some manifolds. You basically have two types of manifolds. Uh, just to say it short, there's a log style manifold. It's this manifold. It's cast iron. And it's basically quite a simple layout. This is for a six cylinder BMW M50. And it has the rectangular flange for the, as I just called it, an aftermarket turbo. So you cannot straight fit an OEM original manufacturer turbo on this flange. That, then you need to have an adapter. And this is a very strong, very reliable manifold. It's quite heavy. It can take huge heat spikes, so it will not warp, it will not tear, it will not crack. It's just a very strong piece. However, the design is quite flawed, as I'll explain to you guys in a few minutes. The other type of manifold is a tubular manifold. This is one made by us. It's an Einzel manifold. And this is uh, basically a lot better um, in almost every aspect than the log style cast manifold. This is a stainless steel manifold, it has a thick flange that we had laser cut and um, it has another flange on this side and you can see that this flange corresponds with the turbo that I just in my hands which is the OEM, the Mitsubishi uh, original equipment turbo which has a strange flange. Um, so we made this specifically for that turbo and you can also see that this is a twin scroll manifold so it means that the first three cylinders and the last three cylinders which are paired they will blow into the turbo independently of each other so a twin scroll turbo basically is two turbos in one the hot side of the turbo consists out of two sides and they are completely separated from each other and they spool up the turbo wheel uh, like in a stepped way and you'll just get a much nicer spool and it's very desirable. If you go with a very small turbo, let's say you build a 1.6 engine with a turbo in there uh, or a small uh, other type of small four cylinder or maybe a very small six cylinder like a two liter, then maybe it's better just to keep it standard and take a log style manifold because you're just not gonna have the displacement to get uh, the right spool and to get maximum advantage out of this. However, this is a superior design to uh, the log style manifold. And I'll show you guys in a few minutes with a test how that works. I also have a third manifold that I'd like to show you. This is also a log style manifold. It's also for the BMW M50. But you can see over here that with each cylinder added, it becomes bigger. So technically speaking, that's a better design because it will not slow the gases down as much as uh, the other one that I just showed you. This is where cylinder one comes up, two just joins them and then the whole assembly becomes a bit bigger and then it's actually quite bulky just before the turbo. Uh, what's also nice about this design is that it has a wastegate which is on in front of the turbo so you don't need to get a, a, a wastegate welded on the turbo housing or somewhere else. It's just a very, very simple and strong design. Again, this is quite heavy, 
I don't know how much, but it's it's like at least uh, 10 or 15 kilos. So that's a big disadvantage of it. But these are made for passenger cars, for road cars. This was a kit you could buy. This is made in Brazil and it was just made to make 250, maybe 300 horsepower on a BMW 2.5 engine. And I'd like to explain to you guys a few things now about the efficiency of the manifolds. So to show some stuff about the efficiency of the manifold, what I've done is I've taped uh, very small uh, plastic pieces of indicator tape on each port. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some shop air in them. And what we basically don't want is that if we put shop air in cylinder one, that for instance cylinder four or six gets movement because that's blowback. So that means that the expansion of the gases does not go into the turbo, which would be positioned right over here, but that, that those gases would actually go back into the engine, which of course is a very bad thing and you lose a lot of energy which should go to the turbo. So we'll just indicate that with this uh, small test. We'll just put a little bit of shop air here on number one. And you, can, and you can see that all of them start moving as soon as I put a little bit of air over here, then six, five, all of them are moving. So that means that if the expansion of the gases happens in cylinder one, that it will affect basically all the other five ones and not uh, spool the turbo as much as you would like. So that's the, the Mosselman uh, log style manifold. It's quite a simple manifold. Like I said, it's quite a straightforward design. But if we take the, the Brazilian design, which is like an improved style log manifold, we can do exactly the same thing. And you can see that, that they're basically all of them are moving. Cylinder five, four and five are not moving as much, but the first, uh, the first uh, three and uh, cylinder six are moving quite finely because of the air that I put into cylinder one. So that's, that's not a very desirable thing. So the Brazilian one is a bit better than the Mosselman one. Still both not ideal, and then we take the tubular manifold, the twin scroll manifold, and if I put air over there, you see that there is almost no movement uh, going on. None of, the, none of the ports are affected by air that I put in port number one, so basically that means that everything goes into one of the two ports that go into the turbo, which means that this is quite an efficient um, well operating manifold and that's basically what you want. The only problem is that the cost of these manifolds of course uh, we made this by hand so we have the flanges made from uh, stainless steel all the tubing is from stainless steel and this is just quite a lot of work just to build this just to figure it out. Um, you might think it's just a matter of connecting the pipes going from A to B but you also need to be able to put the manifold on the car so you need to think about where you're going to put the tool to fasten uh, the bolts or studs um, and you have to uh, do a lot of packaging so the manifold goes on the engine just like that and then the turbo simply has to be put somewhere in this case it's a uh, bottom mount turbo so that just that just sits right over there and that's uh, that's how it sits in this uh, application so it's not so easy to design a manifold um, we've designed this completely and we're quite happy that it works so well um, but like I said that's the most expensive uh, version that you could make um, these ones I think I paid 500 euros for this one at some point I don't know how maybe eBay or something like that these ones the Mosselmans they usually go a lot cheaper you could buy a complete Mosselman kit for uh, I think 500 or 1000 euros at least that's what I always paid for them so I think a separate manifold would be worth couple hundred euros maybe 250 euros so it's good it's a good plug and play manifold on the M50 um, and you can use a standard size I think this is a T3 flange a standard size aftermarket turbo so it's good for a budget build but it's not going to be a very efficient uh, manifold and it's not going to work if you want to get a really good spool or you want to make high numbers with it so that's basically a few words on those manifolds then there's another very important thing that I always feel is something that a lot of people don't think about and that's the turbo position. The position of the turbo on the engine for me is extremely important. Uh, the reason why is that for instance the turbo has a weight of, I think this turbo with everything in it, this is a mock-up turbo without a wheel or anything in it, 
So this is gonna weigh somewhere between 10 and 12 kilos. And if you're gonna position it high on top of the engine and to the front, well, uh, that's just not very good dynamics. Uh, you basically want to put uh, something this heavy as low and as far to the back of the car as possible. So then you would, um, just for the weight distribution, you would wanna put it right over here. Uh, I also like this position for another reason, and that's because in this case, this is an aluminum engine, but the BMW M50, a Toyota JZ or a Nissan RB, they're all cast iron engines. And that means that this part of the engine is cast iron, where the head of the engine is gonna be an aluminum head. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna concentrate a lot of heat here on the aluminum cylinder head, and it's gonna transfer right into cylinder one and two. And that's actually a spot where you wanna keep it cold because you're forcing the air to cool down by means of an intercooler. So it's just a bad way if you spend all that money and all that thinking into cooling the air down, which enters over here, if you're concentrating a lot of heat just right there at the same spot. So for me, that's not a very good position. Usually you don't have a choice because the turbos are quite a big size. So they probably don't fit in the bottom mount position. And uh, the bottom mount position in a thermal way is also better, like I said, because the cast iron engine um, will simply not transfer heat as much. So it's gonna isolate the heat simply because it's cast iron. Also, it's not as bad to have a little bit of more heat on this side of the engine because that's not where the combustion happens. Um, the combustion happens over here, so that's where you want to have as cool as much intake uh, and as hot as outtake as, as you would like, as hot as exhaust as you would like. So, so that's a few words on the position of a turbo. I would say if, if the packaging allows it, you should always go with the bottom mount to the rear. You could go with bottom mount on the front, uh, which is something that some guys actually use. It's also quite a good position, but I would try to steer clear of making the top mount front position. It's just not a something that I'm a big fan of. The next thing I'd like to address is cooling the charged air. So what basically happened, what we just talked about, is that the turbo works on uh, thermal energy. So the heat coming from the expanding gases is what actually gives the power to the turbo. So that means that the turbo itself heats up as well. With the intercooler you cool down that air. You have to really think about the size of the intercooler and the type of intercooler. Usually a good rule of thumb is that um, anything that's a good quality efficient intercooler is going to be expensive. If you look inside the intercooler over here, you can uh, see a few uh, uh, lines over there. That's the core of the intercooler. And usually if you look in there, uh, that's a pretty good indication of how high the quality is. You can see how well made it is, or if it's a very rough made, or it's a very nice fine thread of the ribs. So that's basically how that works. And you also don't want to go too big. You also don't want to go too small because you could uh, ruin throttle response if you go too big. And you can, uh, of course, uh, get in insufficient cooling if you uh, use a, a small one. This is an aftermarket uh, intercooler. It's basically a standard thing that a lot of people uh, use. And I can also show you an original intercooler. This is one that comes from a BMW 335i. And if you look inside this one, it's a bit hard to see maybe. Um, but you can see that uh, the internals are much nicer. So the fins in the core, that's all uh, much better made than in the aftermarket intercooler that I just showed you. The big disadvantage of an original intercooler is that they usually have these plastic sides. So it's not very suitable for high boost. And they have kind of a strange connector because it only connects to the original charge pipes uh, that come with the car. So it's not very easy to use that on an aftermarket car. They're usually not the right shape or you want to position the intercooler in a different spot than it would be on the original position. So you have to find a solution to use the, in this case, original BMW fixtures into your aftermarket system. So. Um, a big advantage of these is that a lot of people upgrade them, so they buy a 335i or something like that, and they want to put a bigger aftermarket intercooler on it, so you can pick up these original ones, maybe for 50 euros or something, um, and, and that's just a very good budget way to get a pretty good uh, intercooler in your hands. Um, so yeah, that's a few words about intercooling. You could uh, do a whole separate topic about intercoolers and sizing of it. If you Google it, check online about sizing, there's a way to calculate which size you want to have. Depends on the displacement of your engine. 
It, depend, it also depends on uh, what kind of power you want to make with that engine. So the next thing I'd like to address is the sizing of the turbo. Um, a lot of people think that the only thing you should look at is the diameter of the compressor wheel. That's not always the whole story. There's a lot more other uh, factors that come into play. On the old days you would say that the bigger compressor wheel would be a turbo for a bigger power, so it would be better. However, um, in the past 10 years there's been a lot of development in the OEM turbos. So the shape of the compressor wheels, that's very important. And the, basically the best way to choose a turbocharger is to look at uh, something that, that's called the compressor map. So any manufacturer can give you a compressor map which basically shows you where the efficiency of this turbo lies and the calculations that the manufacturer make will help you. Uh, you basically don't want the turbo to operate outside of this compressor map. So there's a certain RPM of the compressor wheel on this map and it shows a certain behavior that the turbo will have and you just want to stay right into the design uh, of the turbo. If you get a small turbo and you run it on too much boost, it means that all you're doing is heating up stuff. It's not going to work very well. Um, but one of the most common problems that people have with choosing a turbo is that they just get one that's way too big. Um, that means that uh, you don't get a very good spool out of it and you don't get a lot of torque down low. It's a car that will have a fantastic uh, number on it. It may make six or 700 horsepower. But the problem is if you drive it in a real world, it just, it's just not workable at all. It just works on high RPM. It just starts maybe to spool at four or 5,000 RPM and it's just not workable. The setup that we made at Einzel with this turbo and this manifold is that it will do um, around 400 horsepower or more and it will have a very good throttle response because the compressor map is exactly spot on with the needs of the engine and everything is matched right there together. So you may have 400 horsepower considering it as a low number but it's absolutely going to be a very efficient engine. You're going to have a lot of torque down low. If you blip the throttle a few times in a row, it's not going to choke. And you're just going to have a really nice spread of the power that the turbo is going to deliver. May not have the highest dyno number, but in a real life application, like racing and drifting, you're not looking for that last few horsepower that you can get up peak. You're looking for something that's very usable and that's um, something just quite efficient in a race car, especially in an uh, endurance environment, you don't want to waste too much fuel. If you uh, mismatch the turbo sizing, you're just going to burn fuel and it's just not going to happen. Your car may have a little bit higher top end, but it's going to use 30 or 40% more fuel and you're just going to lose the race simply because you have to do an extra pit stop. So that's actually very important. People think that it's good to just to go big because then you always have some room left. Actually, usually the guys that go with a turbo that's too large in size will end up with something that's completely unusable and just cool for the dyno or for talking at the bar, but it's not a car that you're actually gonna enjoy driving. Another thing that you have to do if you do a turbo build, it's a bit of a sidestep because it's not directly related to the turbo, but you have to upgrade at least your head gasket. So what we always do with an M50, which is a very suitable uh, engine to build for a turbo, is we upgrade the head studs. So the head bolts get replaced with studs, usually from ARP. And you always replace the head gasket. You could go with a gasket that will give you less compression. Um, it's a bit of a long story to completely explain the raising or lowering of compression, what it actually does with a turbo. But basically, if you use an engine that's not made for turbo use, and you do a turbo build on that engine, and you're going for high RPM, you absolutely have to drop the compression ratio. One of the reasons for that simply is because you're already adding boost. So that means that you'll get a lot more heat and you could get pre-ignition uh, just from that. You just want um, the mixture to ignite just by the plug and not by high temperature. You also don't want the combustion to go too quick. So it has to have exactly the right rhythm. And you can control that of course with the ECU and you don't want to have a compression ratio that's too high which is gonna basically interfere with the stuff that you want to happen in the combustion side. So this is one type of gasket that uh, you need to use for upgrading. This has uh, rings in it. They seal off very well around 
the, the, the combustion chamber and the cylinders. These have little silicone beads on all the channels. That's a pretty good uh, gasket. Um, basically, this is one of the types that you can get which resembles a normal gasket. So it's a coopering in this time. You can also get an MLS or multi-layer gasket. Um, it's very easy to Google if you want to know exactly the difference between them. It's a bit of a long story to explain. I like the ones with the cut rings. Works really well, especially on high boost or nitrous oxide uh, applications. Another thing you could use is a copper gasket. Um, it also has certain pros and cons. One of the things with the copper gasket is that you can reuse it. We never do that, but technically it's possible to do that. Um, whatever, however, what's very important with this, with any turbo build, if you have a quality head gasket, you have to install it, drive it, map the car, run it for uh, maybe uh, 20 or 30 hours, and then you just have to retorque the studs. There's a lot of people who don't do that. They're complaining online about my copper gasket is leaking, or my multi layer gasket is leaking, or my cut ring gasket is leaking. That's usually a user error, simply because people don't want to take out the camshafts and all that stuff and retort the head. It's absolutely necessary to do that with any type of these gaskets. And please do so because otherwise you're just going to get leaks and you're just going to get problems with it. Another thing with the turbo, of course, uh, in this case, um, you need to put an oil line on it. So you need to find a way if your car is not uh, equipped with a turbo engine, you need to find a way to get the pressure side of the oil into the cartridge. And you also have to be able to dump the oil again into the sump. It's very important that you use a big return line for that. Um, in this case it's a bit of an ugly line, but this was the only one that I had laying around which was still fixed to the sump. This basically sits on the bottom of the engine, this goes on the turbo, and there um, it just drains it back into the sump. It's very important this position, um, it should not uh, be too high because then it's just not going to work. Uh, again, there are tons of people, tons of things to find on the internet about your exact application. Uh, on the engine that you want to use or where you want to position that and how you want to do that. But I always like to, I can't stress enough that it has to be big. It has to have a significant diameter just to get rid of all that oil. So that's a few things about turbos. So remember a couple things. There are two different turbos, the OEM, original equipment manufacturer, and the aftermarket turbos. The aftermarket turbos are usually cheaper. They are a lower quality. Sometimes you can get them in a very high quality, like a Garrett GTX or some other Borg Warners or whatever. So that's a 2500 euro turbo, which is of course an aftermarket turbo of substantial quality. But the basic, the basically the run of the mill normal aftermarket turbos, they are not as high quality as the OEM original equipment turbos. The original equipment turbos also have some disadvantages. One of them is packaging. They're usually kind of a strange shape. So you really need to know exactly which one you need to have. And the other disadvantage of the OEM turbo is that they're usually a bit small. So if you want to do 800 horsepower, it's almost not possible to do it with an OEM turbo. You really need to get an aftermarket one, uh, simply because there are no road cars with one turbo that do 700 horsepower. If BMW wants to make a 700 horsepower car, they put uh, two or four or three turbos on it. Uh, simply because the original equipment turbos are small, so they just need multiple turbos to reach the same um, to reach the same power as you would do with one aftermarket turbo. So that's a couple of things and then we discuss the ball bearings. As I said if you have a big turbo, a big diameter turbo, uh, you can get them in ball bearing because they just don't make that much RPM, maybe 100,000 RPM or less. The journal turbos, the ones that float in oil, are usually the smaller turbos. They make huge RPM, they can go with the original equipment manufacturers you can get them up to 200,000 RPM, so that's a very high RPM. There's just no ball bearing technology yet that can support that. That's one, that's another thing uh, that goes on for the original equipment turbos. And basically we've talked about the manifolds, the log style manifolds, the tubular manifolds, twin scroll manifolds. Just uh, budget up if you want to have a, a good manifold. Uh, I think if you get a reasonable manifold you would have to look at least at a thousand euros. The really good ones will range all the way up to 2000. It's very important also the turbo position, not only for the weight but also for the thermal efficiency of it. So that's the mounting position, a few things about that. And uh, be very sure that you get the right size turbo. So don't go too big, 
just look at the compressor maps that the manufacturers can get talk to people who know their stuff and just choose the right, tur the right turbo so you'll have uh, the exactly the exact right application uh, on your engine so that's a few things i hope you guys like it i hope you subscribe to our channel if you have any questions you can post them below if you have some things that you uh, uh, want to ask us about other things concerning race cars or drift cars just shoot us an email at info at einzel.nl thank you and until the next one